Shudder has the largest, fastest growing human curated selection of thrilling and dangerous entertainment, hence why it's called the Netflix of horror. Shudder is the best streaming service with great thrillers, horror, and suspense for $5.99 a month or $56.99 a year. They're always releasing new content, and new this month was slasher comedy Vicious Fun, about a horror movie critic who stumbles into a support group for serial killers, featuring Anchorman's David Koechner and Anything for Jackson star Julian Richings among the killer cast, as well as the supernatural thriller Sun, where Halloween's Andy Matichak plays a mother who will stop at nothing to save her mysteriously ill young son from a cult she believes is trying to kidnap him, and Candisha, the latest from Inside's Alexandre Bostilio and Julian Murray, about a trio of teen girls who accidentally invoke a vengeful demon. Personally, I love Shudder. There's a vast selection of content, extensive international library, range of genres and types of movies from old classics to modern favorites, and you can stream it ad-free from so many devices like iPhone, Xbox, Roku, and so many more. Recently, I was revisiting the ageless classic 13 Ghosts, where a family inherits a spectacular old house from an eccentric uncle. There's just one problem. The house seems to have a dangerous agenda all its own. Trapped in their new home by strangely shifting walls, the family encounters powerful and vengeful entities that threaten to annihilate anyone in their path. The premise is just great, and the ghosts and their backstories are fascinating and sometimes it plays out more like an action film movie than a horror movie and it's definitely one of my guilty pleasures. So, what are you waiting for? Get started streaming the best horror, thriller, and supernatural content. Shudder's expertly curated collection includes must-see titles like The Dark and the Wicked, The Mortuary Collection, and PG Psycho Gorman. Plus, all the best horror documentaries and the hit Creepshow TV series from executive producer Greg Nicotero of The Walking Dead. To try Shudder for free for 30 days, go to Shudder.com and use promo code Let's Read. That's S-H-U-D-D-E-R.com, promo code L-E-T-S-R-E-A-D. So, a while back, my best friend dated this girl for years, like way before we ever met. They had a super serious relationship too, lived together, talked about kids and stuff, and I think they may even have been engaged at one point. But whether or not that was official with rings and all that, or just them being all romantic, I don't exactly know for sure. According to him, she started out super cool and normal until at one point she just seemed to werewolf out on him. She started getting abusive, hitting him, insulting him, just generally trying to wear him down. The story goes that one night he got so sick of it that he explodes and breaks up with her, like right there and then. She responds by going absolutely ballistic on him, howling about how he didn't love her as much as she loved him, how no one would ever understand her like he did, and that she'd die if he ever left. When he tried to leave, she ended up pulling a knife on him. He said it was terrifying, like he legit thought that he was about to get murdered, and I don't know if he managed to overpower her or, like, lock himself in the bathroom, but the cops eventually came, she was arrested, and it was this whole big thing. Years later, I'm watching the Cubs play with a buddy of mine in some sports bar, when this cute bartender comes on shift. We ended up talking a little, she seems chill and... We're definitely vibing. So when we went to catch an Uber, I asked if she was single. She was. And she gives me her snap so we can organize a date or whatever. We go out, there's chemistry, so we organize a second date. And in the meantime, I end up talking about this girl to the first friend that I told you about earlier. He responds, Is her name Laura? I respond, Yup. Short brown hair? Well, shoulder length, but lip piercing right here. I ask him how he knew, and that's when he tells me the whole story about his psycho ex, and how the girl I was dating was the exact same girl. 
I refused to believe it at first. This girl was super cool. I couldn't even imagine her acting out in the way he described. But again, he's nailing her tattoos, what she drank. Like there's no doubt it's 100% the same girl. And there's no way he'd lie about getting his butt kicked by a girl. Not to sound bad or anything, it was just a very convincing story. But, as Robin Williams put it, God gave men a wiener and a brain, but only enough blood to operate one at a time. And at that point, I was definitely not thinking with my brain. I was all like, dude, it was years ago. She's probably a lot more mature by now. And although I did believe him, I didn't put it past my friend to have embellished his version of events a little, just to make it a better story. The point is, I didn't want to risk missing out on a great girl, just because of some nonsense that happened to them in the past. So... We go on our second date, and although we have a good time, what my buddy told me is constantly at the front of my mind. About three or four drinks in, I start finessing in questions about previous relationships. I'm not making it obvious or whatever, but at one point, she just sort of sighs and says something like, I'll put it on Front Street. I had boundary issues in previous relationships, and that's something I've definitely had to work on in myself. But I'm trying. And I know I've gotten better with it over the years, so not to scare you off or anything, I'm just being honest. And honestly, this stuff was exactly what I needed to hear. It played right into my dumb little narrative of give her a chance when, really, I should have listened to my buddy. The date goes well, we end up back at her place and the next morning, she asks if I want to go get some breakfast somewhere. I really did want to go, honest, I couldn't think of anything better than a fat stack of pancakes to kill my hangover. But if I didn't leave her apartment by 8.30, there's no way I'd ever get to work on time. So I was nice about it, but I still had to take a rain check. When I told her, her face dropped. She got all mopey and rolled back into bed, facing away from me. I respond, you're, you're not mad, are you? She denies it, but she clearly is, and as I'm literally about to leave, she says, I just thought we had a nice time is all. I had to walk back into her room and say super calmly, I told you, I have to work. I'm not ducking you. I have to go to work. She's still making snarky comments as I walk out the door and I'm literally walking out of her apartment thinking, F that. She is so not worked out on those issues. I didn't want to see her again. Not after that, after all. I was pretty certain she'd not be wanting to see me anymore either, the way she seemed. But a few hours later, she's texting me like nothing happened, and I had to remind her that I was still kind of peeved about the way she acted in bed that morning. I figured I'd at least get a reply, but no, nothing. Until the following night, when she sent me exactly this over Snap. And I know this is word for word because I screenshotted it. Love me. Use me. Do me. Make me yours in every way. Want me. Desire me. Crave me. I'll give you everything. I'll give you my life. My world. So long as you love me. Keep me as your partner. Don't love anyone else like you love me. Do it. Please. Crave every ounce of me. Need me. Let me feed you my life and my love forever. I need you. Please. Need me. Crave me. Please. I beg you. Give me your everything and in exchange I'll give myself off to you forever. Please, love me the most, because to me, you're the world, the God on this earth, my love, my life, my everything. Please, love me back. She was so angry that I had screenshotted it. But as I said to her, it was something I did for my safety because if she was slipping into one of those same old toxic behavior patterns that I wanted something to be able to show the cops. She took that even worse, and after that, she stopped replying. I really should have listened to my bro. Like, I know she didn't exactly try and murder me, but I really was a fool for just ignoring him when all he was trying to do was have my back. It reminds me of that Toad and Scorpion story. You know, Toad can cross the river, Scorpion can't swim, so it asks for a ride on the Toad's back. Toad responds, Dude, you'll sting me and I'll die. Scorpion says, Nah, then I'll die too. You're all good. Then what happens? 
scorpion stings the toad mid-swim and both die. Because the scorpion will always be a scorpion, no matter how hard it tries. And scorpions, well, all they do is sting. Uh, I've always been unlucky in love. I didn't have a proper relationship with a girl until I was 19, and when I finally found someone, it was the best feeling in the world. But that peak was followed by a profound trough, and about six months into our relationship, I discovered she actually kind of hated me. She said I smothered her, and that there was a reason that people said, treat them mean, keep them keen. Did she really want me to treat her badly? Why would anyone in their right mind need to be mistreated in order to maintain their affection for someone? That really messed with my head for a long, long time. I thought I'd have to relearn everything I thought I knew about women, about love, about relationships. And it wasn't until after I graduated from university that I was able to get back on the horse and give dating another try. That's when I met Aurélie. She was French, living and working in London to improve her English and broaden her horizons. And she was without a doubt the single most beautiful girl I'd ever laid eyes on. Once more, she'd slotted into my life perfectly, like there was always a piece missing that was perfectly suited for a girl like her. Even my flatmate thought she was brilliant, and he tended to be a bit protective of me, knowing what a terrible time I'd had in my previous relationship. He always thought she was brilliant because she'd given French lessons at £20 a pop, when the cheapest French teacher in London tended to charge about £50 an hour. Stuff like that made me feel like we were becoming a proper couple, the kind of relationship I'd always dreamed of having, being friends with people as a couple, and not just as individuals. But as it turned out, my relationship with Aurelie would end even more disastrously than my first. She and my flatmate would usually have an hour-long French lesson on a Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon. I'd normally get off work about half four, then be home in time to bring them takeout from whichever gaff we'd all agreed on. It was the highlight of my week sometimes, seeing my best mate and my girlfriend getting along like a house on fire. I even had a vision of a future in which she'd kind of be an uncle figure to our kids, especially since I had no siblings of my own. But one day, my office manager approaches me and says I'd put in so much overtime over the past few months that I'd be free to take a half day during some point that quarter. Naturally, I pick the Wednesday that Aurelie's French lesson is set to occur, figuring I'll surprise them both with a bottle of wine and some artisan brie. It was the least I could do for the two people who proved to be a constant source of joy to me. When I slid my key into the lock and pushed open the door, I expected to hear my best mate fumbling over French phrases, playfully chided by an ever-patient Aurelie. But that's not what I heard. In fact, there was absolute silence. Then, right as I was about to call out, Hello, anyone home? I heard something coming from the bedroom. I won't cringe you all out with the gory details, and I'm sure some of you have already foreseen the outcome, but Aurelie and my mate weren't engaged in a French lesson. In fact, I don't think they'd ever been engaged in any lessons at all. They were having an affair. What came next was a sensation I'd never felt before or since, like a mix of numbness and nausea, sadness and anger that seemed to cancel out each other until all I wanted to do was cry. I remember just standing outside the bedroom for a moment, trying to summon the courage to walk in. But I couldn't. All I could do was walk into the living room and start packing my stuff, long enough until one of them went to use the toilet and saw me standing there, boxing up books and whatever else I'd piled up on the carpet. Again, I'd rather not go opening up old wounds with too many details, but let's just say I had to move back in with my mum for a while. I was that depressed. Then came some more wilderness years, too scared to date, but too lonely and lacking in intimacy to be truly happy. I honestly didn't know how I could ever handle anything like that again. And I know this has been quite long-winded already, but I just need you all to understand the logic of what I did next. Anyone else might think what I did was completely and utterly insane, and I don't blame them. I just need them to know I reached the depths of desperation that led me to a particular choice. And that choice was named Pip. Pip wasn't her real name, more like a nickname she picked up after a friend noticed a passing resemblance to Pippi Longstocking. I met her on a dating app, one I barely used due to general anxiety about dating. I was stuck between a rock and a hard place, 
knowing I had to at least put myself out there if I ever wanted to start a family, but being far too terrified to approach anyone. But then, there was Pip, a girl who seemed to exude the same kind of vulnerability I did. One of her prompts on Hinge mentioned something about being patient with her, as she'd been hurt by previous relationships. But then there was a mention of how loyal and monogamous she was, how she seemed to wear her heart on her sleeve with her love of manga, anime, and all things Japanese. So, for the first time in a long time, I actually rolled the dice and sent her a message. I won't bore you with the details, but after a month of dating, I asked her to be my girlfriend. It wasn't just that we hit it off so well, nor was it that she seemed to understand how difficult and stressful it was for me to date. It was how much she seemed to be into me, how reciprocal the attraction was. That was something I realised I hadn't really experienced before, and oh man did it feel good. We spent almost every minute of every day together. Whenever I wasn't at work, I was with Pip. We obviously spent most of our time hanging out in my flat, but it wasn't long before Pip basically started moving her stuff in bit by bit. Not that I had a problem with that. I liked that she was there all the time. And I do mean all the time. Because the thing was, Pip couldn't work because she was disabled. Not with any kind of physical disability, mind you. Pips were the kind of disabilities you couldn't see. Regardless, she received enough in benefits to live comfortably while selling digital artwork where and when she could. For a time, life was good. Really good. But right around Christmas, Pip's behaviour started to take a turn for the worse. It all seemed to arise as a result of me needing to visit my family a lot. Christmas time, you see your relatives. Pretty standard practice. But not only did Pip not want to visit her own relatives, she didn't want me to visit mine either. And on top of that, whenever I did leave the flat to go and visit them, she'd be in an absolutely foul mood when I got back. It put a real dampener on the festivities, and I know my mum and dad were disappointed when I could only stick around long enough to swap presents and eat my Christmas dinner. Me citing that Pip didn't like it when I was away for too long, and their negative reaction to that, I just knew things would come to a head after a while. I needed a girl I could take to family events. Someone who'd become a part of my family, not one who avoided it. But when I tried to talk to her about it, she raised her voice to me for the first time ever in our relationship. She told me I knew damn well she wasn't capable of large social gatherings, and I was bloody selfish to leave her alone like that, especially on Christmas Day. The slightest pushback from me, and she burst into tears. Ugly, loud, screaming tears too, before she ran into our bedroom and locked the door. We had never argued like that before. It was like she was a completely different person, and with me being so naturally timid, I found the level of fury she was able to summon, frankly terrifying. There was a point she just sort of snapped, where she stopped feeling sorry for herself, and instead just got angry at me. The animosity played itself out for months on end too, like she somehow managed to spin this one disagreement into scores of others. It was emotionally exhausting, but every time I actually pushed back, every time I really did find the balls to tell her no, she put on that sorry puppy routine, and within no time at all, I'd be back under her thumb. It was agonising. I lost all my friends. Contact with my family waned. Constant days off to satisfy her need for attention almost cost me my career. Loss of earnings meant the flat was at risk. She had this horrible knock-on effect on my life, and I didn't even realise it until it was too late. And by then, I'd begun to think the unthinkable. I started to consider breaking up with her. It was surreal. Meeting a girl I thought I'd spend the rest of my life with, fretting over the prospect of her jacking it in and leaving me. And all the while, it was me who'd want to be the one to up sticks first. I guess I was just incredibly needy, naive and inexperienced when it came to dealing with the opposite sex. And god, I did pay for it in the end. I had to actually get drunk to do it. I have such a low tolerance for alcohol that only two pints of Heineken did the job. But honestly, I don't think drinking made it any easier to bear. She begged and she screamed. She told me I was drunk and didn't know what I was talking about. She threatened to hurt herself. She threatened to hurt me. She threw stuff around, smashed glasses. The whole thing was just a vision of hell. But in the end, she actually did accept it. Or at least, she seemed to. After a few hours of neighbourly complaints and threats to call the police, she calmed down then went into our bedroom and locked the door. Knowing I'd be sleeping on the couch, I hoovered all the broken glass off it, 
dealt with the rest of the mess as best I could, then tried to get some sleep. I figured I'd best be getting used to the couch too, as although we were now officially broken up, I still agreed to give her a month or two to find another place to live, since my name was on the lease. One night on the couch goes okay, so as much as it was grim to still be living with her, I didn't think Pip would pose an actual, tangible threat to my safety. After all, she was five foot nothing, and I wouldn't have any trouble overpowering her if it came to some sort of physical altercation. But that's not what I should have been afraid of, and the real trouble came when she saw I was packing my bags. She was definitely acting different after she saw that, and when she asked why I was doing it, I told her it was because I was heading to my parents for a while, just until she could find her own place. I didn't think it was doing us any good living in the same space, and it would help us move on from each other if we did a week or so with no contact. I didn't think she'd respond very well to that, but to my surprise, she seemed to take it in a stride. That, however, turned out to be nothing but a front, and I think by that point, she had already made up her mind regarding what she was going to do. That night marked the beginning of my second week on the couch, and little did I know, but it would prove to be my last. Not for good reasons, either. Not because Pip had found a flat, or because I was heading to my parents' place. Because she was planning something that would change my life forever. After Pip went to bed, I stayed up for a few hours, polishing off a beer or two before I finally turned in. When I woke up again, I realized I couldn't see out of one of my eyes. I sat up and realized my face felt warm and wet, and out of my one good eye, I could see Pip, and she was as white as a sheet. I reached up to touch my eye, but I couldn't. Something was in the way. Something long and cold and metallic. I just heard, I'm sorry, before she bolted from the room. I look down, and I see all this blood splattering on my thigh and on the couch, dripping down my face from what was obviously a horrible wound to my eye. I think the adrenaline kicked in there and then, because I leapt up off the couch, grabbed my phone to call an ambulance, and grabbed a tea towel to stem the bleeding. You think that in that moment you'd freak out that something terrible had happened to something so precious, but I just had this a resigned feeling of, oh well, at least you've got the other one working okay. It's definitely not the reaction I thought I'd have, like the despair of knowing you'll be half blind for the rest of your life, but I guess you just rationalize it. Thank God you're still alive and then set about getting help. As I was on the phone to the paramedics, I realized that Pip had locked herself in my room, but that didn't mean I was safe until I was locked away from her. So, with one hand holding the tea towel over my eye, and the other holding the phone, I leaned my back on the side of the couch and pushed with my legs until it was set squarely up in front of the living room door. Everything was just weirdly calm. Like, I know my heart must have been hammering, but the way I was talking, the way the dispatcher was responding, I swear I've ordered pizzas in a more excitable way. It was only when I was actually in the hospital and my mum came to visit that I broke down and cried, just grieving for the sight in my right eye, which, as I expected, was never to return. Pip was arrested, and after a short trial, was convicted of attempted murder. I think her solicitor wanted to get her charge knocked down to GBH, but after examples of her behaviour were presented to the jury, mostly the scarier, more violent text messages she had sent me, and she made the mistake of pleading not guilty, the prosecution went ahead with attempted murder, so that's what she was convicted of. By the time she gets out, I'll be 41 years old, still blind in one eye, but hopefully not still trying to find a partner, and hopefully free of the nightmares too. For the past six years now, I've worked in the domestic violence unit of one of the largest police forces in the UK. In all honesty, it's not something I ever saw myself doing, and I still have aspirations of being a firearms officer. But my time with the DVU had been more rewarding than all the other police work I've done combined. No offense to other departments, but never before had I felt like I was having such a direct impact on the community. Yes, domestic violence cases can be very complicated and very sensitive, but when you finally get the nod to arrest an abuser or help a victim flee a potentially life-threatening situation, 
It's a real knight in shining armor feeling. Although every case I've worked is memorable for its own reasons, there's definitely a handful that stand out as particularly bizarre or grim, and one of them is definitely the first case I had where the victim was male. Male domestic violence victims are quite rare, much more common than you'd first think, but still quite rare compared to the masses of male-owned female cases we get. And the thing that really sets them apart is the level of emotional manipulation that comes into play. Most male domestic abusers use physical strength or financial constraints to control and subdue their victims, whereas female abusers tend to employ some disturbingly creative methods of psychological manipulation in order to maintain control and prevent from being arrested. And that's what really got me about the case I'm about to talk about. How the bloke in question had all the means to just walk away and save himself, he just couldn't find it in him to do so. Because I want to protect the anonymity of the innocent here, and he was my first male victim of domestic abuse, we'll very unoriginally call the bloke Adam. So, obviously, his girlfriend in this case is going to be Eve. I first became aware of Adam and Eve when some marked units passed on some information regarding a potential domestic incident. Their neighbors had called, complaining of the most awful racket coming from Adam and Eve's flat. Not the late night party kind of racket either. More like the violent domestic kind with smashing crockery and slamming doors. The marked units, and by that I mean regular uniformed officers in a marked car, paid them a visit, only to find that there had been a bit of misunderstanding, and the couple had in fact been watching an action film. Any banging, rattling, slamming, or shaking could be explained by their brand new, top-of-the-line sound system, and although they were very sorry for any inconvenience caused, there had simply been a misunderstanding, that they said. It's at that point that one of the officers asked if it'd be okay if he came inside to talk to each person separately. 99% of the time, this isn't a problem, and they're more than willing to pop the kettle on and have a chat for a few minutes, especially if it's to clear up any suspicions of violence. But Adam and Eve say no, or rather, Eve says no. Adam just sort of nods along, and the officers leave with a distinctly uncomfortable feeling about the whole thing. As you can imagine, whenever this happens with the genders reversed, it ends up straight on my desk. And since our domestic violence policy is the same regardless of gender, I happen to catch wind of Adam and Eve's rather seismic home entertainment system and decided to make note of it. I'd seen this kind of thing countless times before. The classic case of a couple falling over themselves to explain away all manner of bizarre coincidences, all when one little explanation covered for all of it. Violent domestic abuse with a victim who was too scared or too broken to do anything about it. It's by far the most frustrating thing about domestic violence cases, how every so often you meet someone who just refuses to help themselves. I say frustrating, but Sometimes it can be downright terrifying, especially when you get an idea of the web of lies and delusion a person has spun for themselves. I'd just never seen or heard of it happening to a man before, so naturally, it was extra jarring for me. I don't mean that to sound rude or anything. My colleagues had warned me to expect the unexpected, so to speak, but, well, you'll see what I mean in a second. As I've explained, Adam and Eve were already on our radar, so when we got word of another domestic violent complaint originating at their address by the month's end, we thought it was about time we step in. The first step of what turned out to be a long, grueling process was a simple phone call. I gave Adam and Eve's house phone a ring one afternoon, not really expecting anyone to answer, but after a few rings, someone picked up. It was Eve, and despite being a bit surprised, she remained polite when she learned it was the police that were calling. I asked how she was, inquired about the recent incident, and found out there had only been another hilarious misunderstanding between them and their neighbors. This time, they were trying their hand at a spot of DIY and had gotten into a disagreement about the positioning of some shelves. That explained all the banging, crashing, and shouting that they could hear. I'd learned to recognize a lie quite easily at that point, but it wasn't one I was interested in at that stage. All I wanted to know is if it'd be okay for a colleague to pop over for a chat, maybe even the same day I was calling. Like I said, most people are only too happy to clear up misunderstandings, but for some reason, Eve insisted on coming to us. 
I told her it was no bother if we drove over to her place, the idea being to get inside and get a lay of the land, but she seemed very, very resistant to the idea. I then decided to try and get in touch with Adam, but after I tried and failed to raise him at least 20 to 30 times at all hours of the day, I realized my mistake. Eve have evidently told him that they were under suspicion and not to answer any calls from unknown numbers. My only option was to corner him at work. I know that might sound a bit aggressive, but in serious domestic violence cases, every single day counts. The sooner you get the ball rolling on getting the victim out of the picture, the less chance you have that their abuser is going to snap and end their life before you can either make an arrest or find shelter for the victim. So, as much as this might sound a bit patronizing, it really is for their own good that we operate so robustly. When I turned up, he was perfectly polite and cooperative, but when I asked him if he wanted to talk in private, he declined. I have nothing to hide from anyone, I remember him saying. I insisted on us finding somewhere more private to talk, but again, he told me he had nothing to hide. So, in as low a voice as possible, so his colleagues wouldn't hear, I asked him if his wife was abusing him at home. He just stared at me for a minute, like I'd suddenly grown an extra head. He asked if I was serious and let out this little chuckle when I informed him I was. He assured me that no, he wasn't being abused and did so in a tone that ridiculed the very idea of it. Now, here's where I let you in on a bit of tradecraft. Abusers have their victims by the neck in some manner, whether that be through threats of violence, financial means, threatening to withhold contact with children. All you have to do is find that thing that's keeping them from speaking out, and you push that button until they break. With Adam, I thought there might be kids in the picture, Maybe she was threatening to rinse him with a divorce, something to that effect. But it turned out to be something altogether different, and altogether much more disturbing. So, I started through the list. I asked him if she was hurting him. He lied and said no. But then as far as I could tell, he answered every other question honestly. It wasn't the finances, there were no kids, she wasn't pregnant or anything, and it turned out they weren't actually married just a live-in couple who apparently were planning to tie the knot one day. It wasn't long before I was clutching at straws until suddenly a thought occurred to me. Had she ever hurt anyone else close to you, Adam? I asked him. Has she ever hurt your mum or... I was about to finish with dad, but I didn't have to. The look he gave me told me all I needed to know. And when I once again suggested we find somewhere quiet to talk, he nodded and let me into one of his office's conference rooms. Once we were alone, it all came out. Eve was violent, abusive, manipulative, controlling, and she had him by the balls. He'd once gotten so sick of her behavior that he tried to break up with her, and she'd flown into such a rage that he thought she might kill him. She didn't, evidently, but she did, as he put it, kick seven shades of the life out of me. But that wasn't the worst part. During their vicious argument, Adam had let slip about how even my mom thinks you're a psycho. That proved to be one heck of a mistake as Eve wasn't the kind of person to let a comment like that go. She drove over to Adam's mom's house, charmed her way inside, then FaceTimed him as she basically tortured her with household objects. Obviously the police got involved and Eve was looking at a criminal conviction, but somehow the whole thing got chalked up to some sort of family spat, and Adam convinced her own mother to drop the charges. It was a classic example of why domestic violence cases can be so frustrating. The victims can be their own worst enemies, helping facilitate their own suffering. Once she'd proved she was willing to hurt his mom, that was that. Eve could get Adam to do and say just about anything she wanted him to. The one thing he was holding off on was marriage and kids. He'd managed to feed her some spiel about not quite being ready about waiting for a promotion at work or waiting until his uncle's inheritance came through. But those excuses were wearing thin and soon he was going to have to either leg it or take the plunge. I think that's what's pushed him over the edge, the anxiety of knowing he was going to have to marry her and me touching on the whole incident with his mum. Anyway, we have this heartfelt talk. I promise I'll do all I can for him and his mum and we part ways with me thinking 
that I've cracked it. The thing was, he seemed like a really nice bloke. He obviously loved his mum and wanted to look after her since his dad passed away. A bloke like that deserves happiness, and it felt good that I was going to help him on the road to achieving just that. But sadly, that wasn't to be. A week later I was off duty when I got a phone call from a colleague I was working on a case with. He told me that he'd be outside my house in 10 minutes and we needed to go to the hospital. When we arrive, Adam was lying in a hospital bed and the state he was in put a lump in my throat. Eve had near enough bashed his head in. The doctors said he was lucky to be alive and although he was slipping in and out of consciousness, they told us they were still very much in the process of trying to save his life. We were allowed a brief chat with him, but we were told that he might not have much longer left to live. I know it sounds selfish, but all I could think about was getting a statement off him. I should have been more focused on his health, on wishing him well or something like that, but I was just a robot. If he passed without us getting a statement pinning Eve as the attacker, there was a chance she'd get away with murder. And don't get me wrong, if he stayed quiet, we'd still have a chance at getting her locked up but he insisted on telling us, and the doctors, that he'd near smashed his skull in by falling over drunk. I begged him. I'll go right out and say it. I begged him to tell us the truth. I knew well it was Eve that had hurt him, and that it wasn't some accident. I just needed him to admit it. He was right on the verge, right on the cusp of giving us the statement we needed to get her in cuffs. But then, she turned up at the hospital and after a minute or two alone with him, we lost our chance. He was once again insistent that it was just a horrible accident and that he should never have been on the vodkas. Two days later, Adam was dead. There was a bleed in his brain. Doctors had tried to operate and he died on the operating table. They'd done all they could to save his life, but the damage to his brain was nothing short of catastrophic. On the news of his death... We had a few marked units rush over to Adam and Eve's place. They arrested her and tried their best to preserve the integrity of any potential crime scene, but it was no good. Eve had scrubbed the place top to bottom. Homicide kept her in for 36 hours on an extended stay, turning their house upside down in search of a murder weapon or bloodstains, anything they'd be able to build a case on. But it was no good. The woman was literally about to get away with murder and there wasn't a single bloody thing that we could do about it. She'd even managed to record Adam saying this was an accident, etc., during that visit in the days before he died. She was untouchable, and it really, really hurt. Not only that, but the level of control such a woman was able to exert was just frightening. She couldn't have been any taller than 5'2". She was no real physical threat to anyone except Adam's poor old mum. But let me tell you, it's women like that who were accused of being witches back in the day. I mean, it was honestly just kind of spooky, the kind of effect she had on him. Like she had him under some kind of spell or hypnosis. Don't get me wrong, each and every one of the domestic violence cases I've worked have been distressing and or disturbing in their own right. But this was the first time I saw some of myself in the victim. How I too might have been drawn in by a person's apparent vulnerability only to find that one day, I was ensnared in a web that I'd only be free from, like Adam, on the day my heart stopped beating. I've been lurking through this sub for quite some time now, and as much as I've noticed the daily flood of questions and discussion topics surrounding obsession love or yandere, there doesn't seem to be many people willing to give an insight into the kind of mentality we have or the feelings we experience. I see a lot of people making jokes about it, turning something very serious and dangerous into pure meme fodder, and I feel like I should voice my objections. I feel like a lot of you have whitewashed the idea of obsessive love, painting it like it's something to be treasured as opposed to something to be feared. You see, the core of the issue is when Someone really loves you, like really loves you. They could never, ever hurt or hate you. You accept the faults or shortcomings of someone you love, and to bring up that old adage, 
if you really love something, you have to be prepared to let it go. Well, for the longest time I couldn't let go. I was mentally incapable of doing so, and trust me, Yundere's like me have their emotions grounded far more in hate than in love. We hate the idea that a person could be apart from us. We hate the idea that they could betray us. And we hate all those around them for drawing their attention away from us. The pure love that I see people talking about in the sub, it doesn't exist. It's dancing on a knife edge until it falls off into hate. Just pure, wild hatred. And that's what drove me in the end. Not love. The point at which I realized I needed help was when my stepdad caught me trying to guess the code to his gun safe. He and my stepmom sat me down and asked me what was going through my head. I thought they'd be mad. Like real mad, but they just seemed scared. I'd never ever seen them get like that with me. Looking at me like I was dangerous. But I guess that's exactly what I was at that point. And the real scary thing was how easily I'd gotten to that kind of mental space. The logical bridges I'd used to get from, I just really like this guy, to, his girlfriend has to die. I remember breaking down at the kitchen table when I finally admitted to myself what I wanted to do. And that was kill. For the first time I felt shame. Shame at the kind of selfish attitude I'd had. An attitude which held my messed up feelings over another person's very right to exist. But it was only really when I laid my plans out to my parents that I realized what a monster I'd become. You think if I wanted to keep a boy all to myself, I'd at least come up with some sort of way of not being caught for his girlfriend's murder. But honestly, I didn't care. Getting caught was actually part of the plan. Everyone needed to know that it was me. Everyone needed to know what a dedicated, loyal person I was. I'll kill for you. That's what I needed to say, and I wanted to prove it too. I was planning on shooting her dead right there in the hallway at school so that as many people could see as possible. If I told one or two people to get their phones out, I could have a visual record of my endeavor and that would last forever and ever. Amen. Sure, I'd go to prison, but only for a while. My foster parents would no doubt pay for some fancy pants lawyer to get me off by reason of insanity. Maybe whittle a judge down to giving just a couple of years in a secure facility or something. That way, in a relatively short space of time, I could be back with my man, loving life, and being the perfect girlfriend I knew I could be. But all of that was just a grand delusion, and I talked myself into it so hard that I actually decided to take the next fatal step and try to get my hands on a gun. Honestly, what came after the impromptu intervention was most definitely not pretty. My foster parents withdrew me from school. I had to go see counselors, psychiatrists, all kinds of fancy doctors and therapists that were supposed to help me figure myself out. I was reluctant, naturally, but they really did help after a while. They didn't so much tell me what was wrong, rather led me down the right track until I arrived at the right conclusions on my own. A huge part of it was the lack of attention I'd received in my formative years. My foster parents had only stepped in when I was seven, probably saving me from becoming an even worse person perhaps, but before that, the lack of love and affection I'd received from my deadbeat bio mom and dad meant I simply hadn't developed properly. I'd like to think that I have a kind of intelligence, like I know I'm not dumb, but that craving for attention and affection that tends to be targeted at people unwilling or unable to give it. I understand how that's led me to make some really dumb choices in my life. I think the main reason to me writing this up is to ask people to stop fetishizing obsessive love. I get that some people just don't understand what it actually is, and it's great that people are asking questions about it, but I see people in the sub who know well how dangerous it is, and they're pushing it on people regardless. It's malicious. There's no other explanation for it. There are people in this sub who are romanticizing murder, who are doing exactly what I used to do during the darkest and most dangerous time of my life. And let me tell you firsthand, they are not your friends. Please be safe out there, people. And if you need help, don't hesitate to reach out, either to me or some kind of healthcare professional. Think of it as saving a life, 
and not just other people's, saving your own life. Born on December 30th of 1982, Ryan Poston spent much of his formative years as a traveling international student. He attended the international school in the Philippine capital of Manila, as well as the international school in Geneva, Switzerland, before eventually enrolling at Indiana University, where he triple majored in history, geography, and political science. Following his graduation, he moved on to study law at the Sam and P. Chase College of Law at Northern Kentucky University. Much to his parents' pride, Ryan graduated law school with flying colors and took up a job as an attorney in Cincinnati, Ohio. By 2011, Ryan was 28 years old and was living the kind of high-flying lifestyle that many can only dream about. The only thing that was really missing in his life was a romantic partner, and this is how the 28-year-old attorney met 19-year-old Shayna Hubers using the social media app Facebook. At the time, Shayna was friends with a relative of Ryan's, so it wasn't like the two were complete strangers when they began talking. And despite the significant age gap between the two, the couple found that they shared a fair amount of chemistry. Not long after, they officially began dating. It was around this time that Shayna graduated with a degree in psychology from the University of Kentucky in Lexington. Previous to this, Shayna had been just 80 miles away, definitely not the easiest drive, but the couple seemed prepared to overlook the distance. However, Shayna's graduation seemed to have sparked off a kind of poop or get off the pot moment in their relationship, and when Ryan professed reservations about the couple moving in together, it appears a mild strain soon became a vast schism, and what was previously a solid relationship became extremely volatile. They went through something of a breakup then makeup phase together, splitting and reuniting several times throughout early 2011 to mid-2012. But it seems by October of 2012, the couple had broken up for good, as Ryan had no interest in getting back with Shayna. This might partly have been motivated by his fling with blonde bombshell and former winner of the 2012 Miss Ohio pageant, Audrey Bolta. It's unclear how Ryan and Audrey met, but it's clear that he was nothing short of smitten with his new belle, and the pair planned a rendezvous on the evening of October 12th. However, that very same evening, the Highland Heights Police Department received a call from a woman claiming to have shot her boyfriend in self-defense. She told dispatchers that she had shot her boyfriend six times after he had attempted to club her to death with a blunt object during an argument that had apparently arisen after next to nothing. According to her, her boyfriend was routinely abusive and the shooting was the result of a long campaign of domestic violence and mistreatment. However, when the police arrived on scene, they found the victim to be none other than Ryan Poston, and the woman claiming to be his girlfriend was Shayna Hubers. Naturally, the cops threw the cuffs on her, read her Miranda rights, and drove her down to HQ for questioning. During her interrogation, Shayna went into great detail on how she'd had no choice but to shoot Ryan in order to save her own life, but she also made very curious comments on how Poston was very vain, and that she'd given him the nose job he'd always wanted. This was remarkably unusual given that even severely abused women show at least some degree of remorse. No one wants to have to kill someone. No one wants to resort to taking a life. Yet Shayna continuously made strange non-sequitur comments such as, I don't know if anyone will ever want to marry me if they know that I killed a boyfriend in self-defense. In such circumstances, having just taken a man's life, this fixation on love and relationships was perceived to be highly unusual by the investigating officers. But it was what Shayna did when she believed no one was watching that people found truly shocking. After being left alone in the interrogation room for a few hours, the mask began to slip. Previously, she had at least tried to play the role of a woman who had been seriously oppressed by a violent, abusive, and controlling boyfriend. Even in the light of her bizarre comments, Shayna still tried to play the part of the traumatized, battered woman. But after about an hour or so, Shayna got up from her chair and began pacing around the room as if gripped by a sudden excitement. She then began to dance, actually dance, 
totally unaware that every single thing that she did was being recorded by the interview room's microphones and cameras. Then she began to sing Amazing Grace, not quite at the top of her lungs, but definitely at a volume which could be interpreted as her not wanting law enforcement to hear. She also said out loud, totally unprompted, I did it. Yes, I did it. I can't believe I did it. I'm so good at acting. As soon as the footage was reviewed, Shayna was arrested on suspicion of murder and held on a $5 million bond. At her trial, prosecutors argued that the motive for the murder was that Poston wanted to permanently end the couple's relationship. Text message evidence that showed Shayna's obsession with Ryan, while her cellmate said that she had bragged about killing her boyfriend. She laughed about shooting him in the face, said she gave him the nose job he always wanted, said Cecily Miller, echoing a statement that had been made to police. She also made it clear that she was going to plead insanity, but said she was too smart for them, and that she was going to make the battered wife defense to get away with it. This battered wife defense is exactly what many of you imagine it to be, the point at which an abused woman snaps and defends herself. It's been used successfully on several separate occasions in U.S. criminal history, but it was clear to all that Shayna's story was anything but the truth. She didn't kill Ryan Poston because he was hurting her. She killed him because she couldn't stand to see him leave her. Four months after being convicted, Shayna was sentenced to 40 years in prison, with her first parole hearing set for 2032. Yet it seems hideously unfair that a woman like that should be given a second chance, especially since it's a privilege that poor Ryan Poston was not afforded. Not when she decided to end his life in the most selfish way imaginable. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Time. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And I'll see you again soon.